<laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, how you feeling out there? That was weak, I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> Give it up one time for Mr. Rick Hall from the Damn Right Blues Band. All right, all right! Yeah. All right, joining us here for a live stream interview going out uh, right now on the internet as well as obviously here at the club. Early, early. All right, thanks for coming down, Rick. All right, man, for you, baby. <laughs> so, uh, you know, can you just, I know we heard a little bit about this uh, from some of the other guys in the band, but can you just give us the quick version of, you know, how did you come to be playing with Buddy? Well, I knew uh, Buddy's brother, uh, rest in peace, Phil Guy, Philip Guy, you guys probably heard of him before. So uh, I used to work with Phil back in the uh, early 80s or late 70s. I don't exactly remember, but uh, we became real good friends. And uh, we worked down through the years, all the way up until, um, I'd say like 19, I mean 2000 and before he passed. I don't remember, but before he passed. Anyway. I was uh, like a, just going back a little bit, I was like a hired gun here in Chicago. When I say hired gun, I mean like I play with everybody under the sun. Everybody. Can you tell us, uh, who, yeah, let's hear about it. Who? who? RB Blues. Uh, well, the guy that played here last night, Lindsey Alexander, called him the Hoochie Man. Uh, I produced two of his CDs out of my studio. Uh, Quintus McCormick another local badass guitar player from here, Carlos Johnson, uh, like I said, Phil Guy, sure. uh, Doug McDonald. It's, it's a lot of guys, I just can't name them all, but it's, I worked here a lot in Chicago, and I also did plays. I used to work for a theater called the Black Ensemble Theater. I did like maybe 10 plays with that theater. I would leave the theater, go straight to Kingston Mines, do four sets <laughs> for the whole weekend. That's what my, uh, my, my thing was, just, just playing behind everybody. Now I gotta ask you before yeah. we get a little further off track here. All right. um, when you said yeah. you were with that uh, theater ensemble, were you acting there or were you performing? No, I was, the, uh, the, the theater or? had a live uh, band. And the band we were doing like a lot of musicals, a lot of, um, Say like deceased, like um, let's see, like Jackie Wilson. We did a Jackie Wilson story. We did the Nat King Cole story. We did um, Marvin Gaye story, and uh, just a lot of old, you know, other people that has passed. That was kind of big in the R and B field back in the sixties and seventies, something like that. So, so were you reading about. music for those, or was there like yeah, scores? Yeah, yeah, I went to, uh, I, I studied at the conservatory here in Chicago. It's defunct now, but it was called Chicago Conservatory, and it was located 410 South Michigan at that time. And I went to school because right after high school, I thought I was going to be a, a big football player. So that's, why, that's the reason why I used to wear a lot of jerseys and stuff back in the day when I first got with Buddy. I was trying to be a, a football star, but I got hurt in my last year of high school, got my hip dislocated. That killed everything. So I said, okay, I'll be a music teacher. So as I said, I went to the conservatory. Um, this was uh, late in the 70s. I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but this was back in the 70s. And uh, at the time I was studying at the conservatory, this was the same time that Albert King was still living. Okay, so at the time he came to the college looking for a rhythm player, and at the time I was studying jazz. So, you know, that entails like a lot of, lot of chords. He was looking for a chord man because he didn't use a keyboard player. He just used a guitar player, three horns, drum and a bass. So, excuse me, I auditioned for him and got the gig. So the, the deal was, my dean told me, say, oh, say, okay, Mr. Hall, if you want to go out with this gentleman, what you have to do is just do all your work, turn it in, and we'll still pass you because you're doing a professional gig. I said, cool. <laughs> all right. And then uh, after that situation went down, the first gig I had with Albert King, 
was in Minneapolis at the Caboose, which they did a live cassette tape now. Not a CD, but a cassette tape. And it was, it was badass. And that was the first time my outing as going out as a kind of professional cat on the scene. Now, then, could you, could you yeah. play a little bit of something that you did on that gig for us? Oh, yeah. All I did was play rhythm. But the thing with Albert King was he wanted uh, to do guitar battles okay. all night. But I wasn't a string bender at that time. Did no string bend. I was just just a chord man and, and played a lot of notes. So every time when we open the show up, he come out with this thing, and then he sit back, light his pipe, and told me to go, just play. You know, I forgot what the name of the song was, but he said, go ahead and play. So uh, I just started playing something. I forgot what the song was, but we were just playing. And he was just sitting there looking for me, waiting for me to break a string. But the deal was, I didn't bend strings. So <laughs> that was going to never happen. So, <laughs> so he just, uh, you know, just sat back and uh, waited until I, I got through doodling around. Then he came in and blasted me. <laughs> I mean, this cat was loud. He played a acoustic, I don't know if, in, if any musicians in here, you know about the old acoustic 360, I think it was. Piggyback. He had two 15s in it, big ass horn, and a, a hundred, I think it was maybe a hundred or 200 watt head, and he turned the cabinet backwards because he played the, the axe wide open. Loud, that's how he got that tone with that that uh, flying V he had with the funny neck stuck on it. So you're saying he actually had the speaker cabinet facing the back of the he stage? He had to, man, because he was, that thing was loud. The 360 acoustic, shh, blow your head off, man. And uh, then I made a mistake with Albert King. I didn't know he played cross Spanish. Cross Spanish, uh, I would say, that's open E for everybody. You know, you tune your guitar in just a straight E chord, you can just play it just like that. I didn't know he played like that. So I was trying to be, you know, in with the cat. So I tuned this, detuned this guitar to standard like we play now. So when we hit, he started playing and he said, who was fucking with my guitar? I said, damn, I done already messed up already, man. So uh, that was my first mistake with him, but he was, he was cool about it because I was a new cat. So anyway, time goes on. The gig was cool, but I just wasn't ready for it. He was a little bit, a little bit too rough to work for. So I said, I've worked with him for like three weeks, and I said, okay, that's it. I'm going back to school. I don't want none of this. So I went back to college again, to the conservatory, that is. And I met another group, a 60s, a 70s group, called the Dells, the original Dells out of Harvey, Illinois. So I played with those cats from like 77 till I met Buddy. Uh, till I met Buddy in 2000, again, till I met Buddy again in 2004, I believe it was. He came to the club, and at this time, Buddy was on that tour, if anybody remembers. He was on a tour with uh, some kind of acoustic tour with B.B. King, Eric Clapton, and and uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's band. That was uh, some kind of tour they were on. Anyway. Was that the Me and Mr. Johnson thing he put out? Um, I, don't, I don't really remember the name okay. of it. Yeah. Yeah, but I remember it was on a tour. All right. But anyway, after he, he kind of finished that tour, he asked his brother Phil, this is where Phil comes in at, asked his brother Phil, uh, who are the cats to look for, you know, because I want to put a new band together and, and go back out on the road with my own band. So. You know, obviously he mentioned me, the drummer, Tim Austin, which you probably seen last week, and Marty Salmon on keyboards. He already had a bass player, which was Orlando. So after uh, he came down to a club where I usually have my jam night every Monday, out where I live at, 
South Suburbs. Wait, so that was your jam night? You were hosting a jam down there? I, I still do. I've been doing oh, this jam yeah? for like maybe 10 years. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I hosted jam, jam on Monday nights in Harvey, Illinois. So anyway, Phil told him where we were playing. And he came out way from here all the way out to Harvey, Illinois. So he was, uh, we were sitting up there playing a lot of R&B stuff at that time. And he came in and, and just sat on the bar. And we was just whispering around, yeah, that go buddy, that go buddy, that go buddy. Oh, yeah. He said, we're going to say something to him in a minute as soon as we get on break. But before we can go on break, he had took his drink and left. I said, okay, well, nah, maybe he was just trying to get away from the Chicago scene and get to the suburbs and cool out. But then he did it again next week. He came back again on Monday to check us out again. And I was going to say something to him this time, but before we can go on break, he was gone. I said, ah, <laughs> okay. Third time he came back. This time he came back before we got started, started playing. And at the time, I had my back to the audience, tuning my guitar up. And he just walked up in behind me and said, hey, man, you want to be in my band? I turned around, just started laughing. I said, man, come on, man, give me a break, man. He said, no, I'm really serious, man. I'm putting a new band together. And I, well, can you be in my band? I said, ah. I said, yeah, man. But I got some other obligations I got to finish before I can join the band. I said, could you wait till I finish? And if you really know, a boss don't have to wait for an employee to get ready for a job. <laughs> don't have to wait. But he said, yeah, I'll wait till you get through doing what you got to do. And then it's a done deal. I said, man, this is crazy. I don't believe this, man. I said, OK. So one thing uh, led to another. We, uh, I got in a band, and we had a rehearsal down at the old club, if anybody remembers the old club down the street. Yep, we played down there. Uh, first rehearsal, I couldn't make the first two or three gigs that, that, for, that he had. So he still let me rehearse so I can still learn the material. And he called in a sub to sub for me for that, those three weeks. And I thought I had lost the gig because I said, man, yeah, we got another cat. I, I, man, I can't make it. But uh, he kept his word. And when they got back and I got through with my obligations, I was in the band, and then we was off to the races, straight overseas to Switzerland. Bam. Straight to see Santana. So that uh, the video that's out, uh, I think it's called Santana Plays the Blues or something like that. Mm -hmm. That was the first uh, outing out that, that I had with Buddy, full, full blast, and we stayed Stayed on the road like almost all year. Now, have you ever done any serious touring like that before, where you go all you know overseas and yeah, the with the uh, the other group I was in, uh, called it Dells, Original Dells, another uh, pro group as right. well. But it was R and B, R and B sure. thing. Yeah. So what was uh what changed for you joining the band? Like what was what was new or different about it for you musically? Musically, uh, it was much easier, you know, because uh, in the R and B, it's a lot of chord changes. In R and B, yeah. it's a lot of chord changes. Blues is a little bit more. To me, it was a little bit easier. You know, one, four, five, basically, and follow Buddy. Whatever he wants to do, just improvise. You gotta be able to improvise with Buddy because you never, never know what he's gonna do. So you just gotta pay attention and dig in. Right on, man. Yeah. Now. Um I guess can you can you play us a little bit of something that you you did on that first tour? Man, that's that's almost ten years ago. I don't remember that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's all right. Well, uh, all right, all right. We'll, we'll come back to that, I guess, man. Right. Um, let me ask you: When did you get the nickname Jazz? I made that up myself because, like I said, when I was in college, I was going to be a bebop jazz guitar player. That's okay. what I was studying: bebop jazz and was gonna be a music teacher. Mm -hmm. So I just made myself Rick Jazz guitar because that's what I was digging at that time. Right on, well can you play a little jazz for us then? Okay. This is a piece by uh, Wes Montgomery, real easy piece, Bumping on the Sunset. Come on, give me some hand claps. Help me out, give me a backbeat, yeah.
so on and so on and so forth. You know, jazz tunes are long, <laughs> long, so, yeah. Right on, man. Now, um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the guitar that you're playing here? What? Okay, this guitar is the first guitar I got when I got with Buddy's band, which was a Strat. When I first came to the band, I was more of a, a 335 cat. Because, like I said, I was kind of into the jazz and R&B type of feel. So then it was it was cool for the first year, but it wasn't it was it was too smooth. It wasn't raunchy. It wasn't cutting, and it couldn't hold up on tour because, as you know, when you're touring around and you got fragile on your baggage, that means throw it extra hard. So by the time the first tour was over, my guitar it was whack. It was it was so far out, man. You know, it's just done. So then I asked uh, Buddy's uh, guitar tech at that time, his name was Mark Messenger. He's now with, uh, I think, Cheap Trick. I think he is. Mm -hmm. So uh, I asked him, I said, man, give me a, a Strat like Buddy's, man. So he knew all the Fender guys. So he called in and got me an artist deal. And this was the first Strat I got, which is a Jeff Beck Strat, soft C neck. Real nice, real nice. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, it, it fitted the gig, you know what I'm saying? You got to get instruments that fit what you're doing. So with the, the tone and the power and electricity that Buddy plays with, if you're going to keep up, you got to have something that's going to hump as well. If you don't, you're done. So I got this, this piece, my first Strat, and then I did a lot of alterations to it because it wasn't quite there yet. So I got some, uh, some texts here in Chicago that, you know, kind of collaborate and we, we kind of experiment on certain things. So at the time I had got this uh, Jeff Beck, not a Jeff Beck pedal, but a Zach Wow overdrive. Any guitar players know about the Zach Wow stuff. And it had such a, a clean tone, then it would get just enough dirt, not fuzzy, but enough dirt and bite that I needed. But what I wanted was something built into the guitar. So I had my, my, my guy that does all my electrical work, I said, man, can you take the board out of the Zach Wild pedal and put it in a guitar? He said, yeah, I don't know, man, we can try it. <laughs> so he- uh, It's definitely he, a different approach. I've yeah, heard I mean, before. no, it's been done before, but okay. you know, I just wanted it for, uh, so I wouldn't have to have a pedal, like when I go to different states or different, when we don't get a chance to take our own gear, sometimes we get crappy gear on the road. It's not always up to part. So if I had that one overdrive pedal, I know I can get away with any amp and still have a good tone when I needed to crunch, when I need to power the whole bit. So anyway, just going forward, I had the, the pedal installed into my guitar, that's why this, this is the Zach Wild pedal slapped in sloppily, but it's in. That's why. And so that gives me like uh, three, a uh, six band EQ now, not three. Most preamps are just, once you put them in, it's either too much, too dark, too light. You know, you, you, can't, you can't tweak them. But when I had the Zach Wild pedal, I know he had a three band EQ on it. So I said, okay. If you put that in there, I have a three band EQ plus my other regular EQ, and I can kind of mess with it when I get to certain locations, certain amps mm -hmm. that was kind of done, you know. Yeah. And it gives me enough power, a lot of good tone, at low volumes and at loud volumes. I can still do it. And even when I go sit in, you know, a lot of cats don't like for you to tweak their amps or give you time to set your pedals up or whatever. So I figured if I had to pedal in a guitar, all I gotta do is hit a switch, and I'm in. So instead of me stepping on the pedal, I got my pedal in here. Secret weapon. No kidding, man. Yeah. But sometimes I still use the, the pedal that I have on my board. I still use that at certain times because it's got a different different tone to what it. What pedal is that? Same thing, Zach Wild. Oh, really? That's okay. my guy, man. Okay, yeah, cool, Zach man. Zach Wild. 
That's that's terrific. Now you've actually got also some uh, very different like kind of thing that you do with your guitar. Oh, usually. I've been uh, dispensed rap unit. I've been endorsing this since like, let's see, the first NAM show that came to Chicago. You remember the NAM show? Yeah. I forgot what year that was, but it was at on Navy Pier. Anyway, I was working at the NAM show for uh, a German company called Shadows. I was into I'm into a lot of gadgets and, and gear and stuff like that. I was uh, dealing with a, a MIDI guitar company called Shadow Guitars. And they had did me a system, so I had to demonstrate it at the NAMM show. I was working for Dean Markley and a bass company called, uh, man, it slips my mind. I forgot the name of the bass company. But anyway, that's how I ran into the uh, spin strap unit. What happened was, after the end of the NAMM show, the guys, the vendors don't want to take none of that stuff back. So they stick around to try to uh, uh, get rid of it, you know. So when the NAMM show was over, I was just walking around, you know, and I seen a guy spinning his guitar, just stand up there by himself. Nobody at his booth. He was just shh, shh, shh. I said, man, I like that. I think this was uh, 1999, maybe. Okay. Yeah, something like 98, 99. So anyway, I went over and talked to him and said, hey man, let me, uh, let me get one of those straps. He said, okay man. So I got the first strap that he, I don't know if he sold anymore, but I got that one. And I had it from 1999 to way up in the almost 2000 before I, I got another one. And uh, it's just been my signature trick. It's a ZZ Top trick, but I mean, I kind of, I kind of. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's everybody's that want to get one. But the only thing about this strap that a lot of guitar players didn't dig, you have to drill a hole in the back of your guitar. And if you got an expensive guitar, you know, once you drill something, a hole in it, it takes the price down altogether. So you got to really think about it if you really want to get into a spin strap unit. But can if you anybody can, for us, man? yeah, if anybody can see it, this is the hookup. I don't know if that's a, and it's uh, like a, a plate, and this pivot is a, like a uh, a contact point, copper against copper, and I used to run this wire, but it. Uh, wasn't cutting it. It was kind of, kind of crappy. So I just, that's why I got this. You see all this tape on my guitar? That's why I redid it and put my wireless back to the original hookup that it comes with. But anyway, I just ordered five more anyway, so I got some more coming. Anybody want to get some, go to my website, www.rickjazz.net. Rickjazz.net, all right. So it's just uh, just some, just a trick, man. Sure. You know, it just gets me out of a lot of trouble. Like when I meet them hot, hot ass guitar players on stage, and uh, you can only do so much with them. And then you got to have something else to to get the people. And usually when I'm uh, playing, it's more about not just playing, but you still have to entertain the people because they come to see. They want to be entertained, not given uh, a music lesson. You know, they want to. Be entertained. So, you know, do a little plan and then you play with them, you know, mm -hmm. make them smile, yeah. make them happy, you know, and they appreciate it more. So I just incorporated this trick into what whatever I was doing, that's all. All right, yeah. well, can you show us? I don't know if I can get it going. How about that, huh? Yeah. All right. Once that's over, that's it. <laughs> it's done. All right. And, uh, you know, it just adds a little bit more to the show, you know. So, yeah. man, do you have, uh, do you still have, you know, projects of your own that you're working on now? Man, we be on the road so much, when I get back, I forget how to run my studio. So I have to almost tear everything down, put it back together so I can remember what the hell I had. Okay. So... As far as projects, I don't have any new projects happening. Mm -hmm. I still got uh, just a lot of stuff on my 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 systems, but mm -hmm. how long have you been, been producing efficient. records? How long have you had a studio? 
Oh man, long time, man. Since uh, I'm say 2000, maybe 2000. Okay. Yeah. Just a, I mean, every musician has a studio in their house. So mine is uh, just totally old school, half uh, digital and half analog. I'm running all Mackie, Mackie stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. Um, do you have some stuff that you've, you know, written or composed? Uh, well, I wrote some songs for that Lindsey Alexander. I wrote songs for him. I did some for, like all the guys I named, Quintus McCormick, uh -huh. uh, all local cats, Doug McDonald, but they badass guitar players, so badass guitar players. Well, can you play something you wrote for us? Man, I don't remember that stuff, man. Oh, come on now. I know, I don't remember, for real. <laughs> I don't remember. It's, all right. I mean, this hasn't been recent. This has been in a while. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure you can, you can play something you wrote at some point for us, right? You got something I know you can hit us with. Okay, this is, I wrote this. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, for real. I don't, I don't remember that stuff, man. Oh, okay, that's yeah. all right, man. That's fine. Yeah, I don't remember. Well, you yeah. know, um, I guess, can you play for us then? Like, what's one of your favorite tunes to do? Oh, one buddy. Uh, one buddy guys. So what you're gonna hear tonight, ladies and gentlemen, when you come back tonight for the 10:30 show. Oh, come back! They ain't leaving. <laughs> they ain't leaving all day, man. That's cool. Um, yeah, you know, I guess I was. I wonder. You seem like you started out with very much a, a strong like rhythm guitar background. You know, well, that's that what. That's what. If you if you're gonna be a working musician, you have to cover all genders. I don't call myself a blues guitar player. I don't call myself a jazz guitar player. I just call myself a guitar player because you have to cover everything. If you plan on, you know, gigging out here, you gotta be able to play everything, man. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta be able to play everything. Um, do you find that there's still stuff you're like trying to sit down and learn or you hear something and you're like, wow, I got to pick that one up? Only buddy CDs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, only buddy stuff, man. All right. Yeah. Um, well, man, this has been terrific having you up here. Oh, that's I mean, it? No, no, no. Oh. Well, I mean, you can play, give us a little more, please. We'll take whatever we can get out of here. Oh, no. Uh, I'm done, man. I, I'll be playing here tonight, man. I got to... It's going to be a long night. Sure. Now, do we... You know, we did this last time. We see if any are going to stump you here. Do we have any questions out here in the oh, yeah, audience? Any questions? Go ahead, man. So, uh, Rick, um, as you have uh, progressed through your career as a guitar player, when do you think you made the most progress as a player? When did you grow the most? Why? What was the most All right, so the question is when progressing through his career, do you feel like he made the most growth as a guitar player and, and what led that to happen? When I decided to be a guitar player, because when I, like I said, when I got out of high school, I went straight to, uh, kind of went straight to work, you know. I was a welder for a number amount of years. And then I got my, uh, I was welding with the wrong lens for years and I burnt the retinas in my eyes. It looks like I'm drunk or high because my eyes are brown, but it's my retinas I burnt because I was burning with the wrong lens for years. So after, after I got laid off from that, and that's when I decided to pick up the guitar and try to, you know, make a living at it. And I just, uh, just kept meeting people, kept networking, and right place, right time, you know, yeah. All right, we got any other questions out there? Where in Harvey? 147th Street, two blocks east of Halston, a club called Larry's. Every Monday from like 9 to 1, when I'm in town. Okay. Yeah, when I'm in town. That's my regular watering hole. I'll be there. I've been there for like 10 years. Yeah, with different artists. Uh, the lady that sung down here a, week, a couple of weeks ago, Nellie Travis. I play with her there every third, no, every fourth Monday. And uh, Joe Barr, another great vocalist, keyboard player, every first, second, and third uh, Mondays. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else out there? All right. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us here, Rick. Before we let you go, can you play just a little bit more one tune here for us? You just play us out with something, whatever mm. you're feeling, man. All right. I like a little Stevie's earlier stuff. No, I think uh, this is Eric Johnson. Okay. Mixed with a little Stevie Ray. Give it up for Rick Hall now. And if they want to find out more about you, man, it's... Uh, go to uh, my website, www.rickjazz.net. That's spelled R-I-C-J-A-Z.net. Got a lot of interesting things on there. Uh, a lot of uh, equipment that I'm endorsing. A lot of gadgets that a lot of musicians might be interested in. So uh, stop by and check it out. All right. Yeah. Thank you, man. All right. Thank you.